All right. Hello, YouTube and anybody else who's going to be watching this video. Me and Brother Michael Strack, we're going to be doing something special. We're going to be reading The Desire of Ages. This is a wonderful book on the life of Christ. And this, uh, my prayer is it will help you understand the Bible better, understand Christ better, and have a closer relationship with Jesus. And so I've been very blessed and by this book, and I hope you will be too. And yeah. Hello. This is Michael Strack, everybody. Hi, I can't remember which camera I left on. Anyway, <laughs> wish there was like a red dot on the camera. So you do which one was live. Oh, that. Because I don't remember. I think, it's, I think that one's on, but I'll, I'll switch them. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully we're on the right camera angle. We hope so. But uh, yeah, so if you've been following along on our Great Controversy Study, we're going to be doing the same thing here. A few lines at a time, breaking it down, painting a picture for us, and uh, we're going to be blessed. So join us here for the next hour, and uh, I hope you will be blessed too. So, what time? 3, 3.35 right now. Okay, yeah. Oh. Note it, an hour from now. Yeah. Shall we pray? Let's do it. Father God, please... Guide us by your Holy Spirit and paint a picture for us as we study. Please, Lord, and give us understanding of, and knowledge of you and the transformation of character is our prayer request. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So you want to start <clears throat> us off? Let's do it. Okay. So with this one, we're not going to slow down as much, or right? We're not going to break down every word, definition. Unless there's a word we don't know or not real clear about. Yeah, yeah um, but you, we can. You don't want to break break it down as much as we have been with the Great Controversy, or maybe you do. Um, maybe maybe not as much, but we, we still want to paint a picture yeah. for our audience. You see what I'm saying? But not necessarily go over the words as much, maybe, unless we need to. Yeah. I don't know all the words. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any perfectly. words you don't know, any ones I don't know, we can. All right. Let's do it. All right. So God with us. His name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. He was the image of God, the image of his greatness and majesty, the outshining of his glory. It was to manifest this glory that he came to our world. To this sin-darkened earth, he came to reveal the light of God's love, to be God with us. Therefore, it was prophesied of him, his name shall be called Emmanuel. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Any thoughts on that? Pretty straightforward, isn't it? Pretty straight. God, uh, Jesus came to this earth to reveal God's character to the rest of the world. And... Emmanuel means God with us. Very good. By coming to, and by the way, if you have anything, of course, you want to say, comment, anytime, whatever. Absolutely. You can interrupt me, and that's all good. Cool. All right. By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. What do you mean? What do you think it means when it says revealed to angels? Too. That's a good question. <laughs> In the great controversy, remember, uh, the war began in heaven, Revelation 12. Before it, before it was brought down to this earth, there was war in heaven. That's right. And so the great controversy theme, not just the book, The Great Controversy, but the theme of The Great Controversy means that there is a conflict between Satan and his followers and God and Christ. Right. That's right. A, a controversy between Christ and Satan, between the followers of Satan and the followers of Christ. And that controversy began in heaven before, before Eve ever bit the, the forbidden fruit. And so there were issues involved in heaven that even the angels didn't fully understand. Huh. So <clears throat> when, to have to, this, there's a lot of detail here. I don't know how, if we want to get into it. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. If you think about Absolutely. it. So... Here are holy angels in heaven 
And one of the one of the angel, one of the angels, Lucifer, began to. It was a mystery how sin, and there's a chapter in here about this, I think. I know there's one in the Great Controversy. But it was a mystery of how sin developed in his heart and how he began to covet God's position. That's what's called the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of iniquity. It cannot be explained. It cannot be justified. Hmm. To explain sin would be to justify it. So there's no explanation. Hmm. The two mysteries in the Bible, the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness. You know, And so... When Satan began to manifest that, that rebellion in his heart and it began to grow, this was something new. This was something that the angels had never seen before. Essentially, Satan was accusing God of hiding something, of withholding a higher position that Lucifer wanted a higher position. And, you know, it's basically saying, you know, why can Christ have this high position? I, I'm just like him. Why can't I be equal you know why can't i have that high exalted position lucifer already had the highest position that a created being could have and he wanted higher mm. and then because he couldn't have it he he began to accuse god and the angels had never had to deal with this before and it was a mystery to them mm. you know what's going on here what is this all about is is god is really hiding something from us, like Satan is saying. You know, this was a mystery to them. It was confusing. So part of the great controversy is God is revealing not only to men the character of God, the issues at stake in the great controversy, but angels also need to understand, right? Hmm. So by coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. Hmm. So not only to us, but... Christ revealed the character of God to the unfallen angels who still, they, you know, a third of the angels followed Lucifer. It's a third, right? Yeah. yeah. And it says a third of the, of the stars fell from heaven. And is it Revelation 12? Representing the angels, the stars representing the angels. But two thirds stayed with, with Christ, fought, continued to follow God, but they probably still had questions and, that they needed to understand more fully. And Christ, humbling himself to be a, a man, permanently becoming a human being, huh. and then not only just to become a human being, to, to, but to suffer you know, the death that he suffered, the experience he went through on this earth. He... Uh, he was revealing to angels the character of God, that God w is willing to humble himself to a lowly human life and to suffer the death of the cross. God was willing to give everything to save fallen humanity. Huh. While Lucifer is like a, it's like a negative image, the total opposite. Huh. Lucifer, a created being, was trying to exalt himself higher and higher to the place where he would kill God. That's what he, he manifested on the cross, that he would, Lucifer would kill God if he could. So it's like the total opposite. Mm. So God, Christ coming here was revealing basically the opposite of what Satan was, the, mm. of Lucifer. Wow. So all of this, I don't know, this is kind of wow. a long explanation. No, that's but perfect. But in this respect, angels, mm. unfallen angels, needed to understand the issues deeper the issues at stake in the great controversy. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that insight, Amen. Michael. He was the word of God, which is God's thought made audible. In his prayer for his disciples, he says, I have declared to them your name, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, that the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. So what, the, uh, what is Christ saying here? He wants that he, same love for his disciples, that the same love that God has for his son, that same love relationship he wants his disciples to have for, for Jesus. For. That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Yeah, so the same love that the Father had for Christ. Mm, okay. He wants that love to be in his disciples. Amen, amen. And him to be in them. That's right. Very good. 
But not alone for his earthborn children was this revelation given. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look. And it will be their study throughout endless ages. That's kind of what we were talking about earlier. Yeah. The earth is the lesson book of the universe. The whole, you know, there are other created beings, intelligent beings besides the human race. That's right. In the universe. And they're looking on. This is the only world that fell. This planet steeped in sin. That's right. And the, the universe is watching to see how God is going to redeem humans from this earth in the, the mess that this planet is in. He's going to redeem them and restore them Amen. into his image. So this is a these unfallen angels and beings, they're looking on, they're learning something about how God operates, his character, his Amen. goodness, Amen. by watching how he's working in this earth. Satan's character is also being displayed. So God is going to solve the great controversy by using the earth as his... What's the word? The playing field, the medium, the uh, the focal point. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, display. Display. <laughs> Exhibition. The yeah. The point of. Okay, I lost my train of thought. But yes, the fact that we just mentioned other worlds and other beings on these worlds, that's biblical. It, you know, this thing, something we just made up, that's biblical. The Bible says that Christ made other worlds. Job talks about the... The sons of God. They came and, they, and there was a conference and For among present, them. Yeah, yeah. They came to present themselves uh -huh. before God. So there was this meeting between God and... And Satan went there representing the earth. Right? And Job... Remember, Satan was among in that council. Yeah, he, he claims this earth as his territory. So he was there. That's right. And so remember, in the beginning, God called Adam son of God. Uh, son of God. And so when God says he had other sons of God coming to this meeting, shows that these are other created beings that God created from different worlds, from other worlds. Hmm. Uh, Satan unlawfully rested or wrested this earth from Christ, but really it belongs to Christ. And he's going to lawfully take it back. Mm. But the controversy has to be completed first. Unfold. Yeah, unfold, <clears throat> come to its conclusion. Amen, amen. You know, I'm really glad we decided to go through this book. This amen. is going to be a blessing. We're going to make it three times longer than the book is, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. Yeah. Because... We want to paint a picture, and we want we want to see the picture of what's going on here, and we want others to see it too. So I'm sure that will be a blessing, and not just hearing a bunch of words, blah 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 blah. You know. Oh yeah. Breaking it down and kind of mm -hmm. what's going on here. Uh, so I've gotten some, <clears throat> and this you know just like a discussion too. We could talk whatever, like we do in a great controversy. I've gotten some comments about the great controversy, like. Yeah, good comment, positive, the way we're doing this, you know, really good. And so hmm. I think we're on to something here. You're in. Yeah, so we're going to keep on doing it. Both the redeemed and the unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. It will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. In the light from Calvary, it will be seen that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life for earth and heaven. That the love which seeks not her own has its source in the heart of God. And that in the meek and lowly one, talking about Jesus, mm -hmm. is manifested the character of him who dwells in light which no man can approach. So... Uh, all that just to say that pretty much <clears throat> God is revealing his true character and that is 
self-sacrificing love, a love that gives. God loved the world so much He gave His only Son. And that's seen in Christ, in Jesus. Yeah, yeah, right. That's mm-hmm. right. And the opposite of that love is selfishness, which is what Satan, that's what dwelled up in, in, in Satan's heart, selfishness. Self-exaltation. Somebody just pulled up probably Carolyn. Yeah, I imagine it is. <gasps> Did somebody get the offering? Huh? Should I go look? Uh, you can keep talking. Yeah, so... Uh, I think... No, he did. Brad took it. I remember him. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, he took it. I seen him take it earlier. Yeah, so... <clears throat> you know what I think we ought to do? What's that? A couple lines at a time and break it down like we did. I don't know how much we're breaking it down and how much we're adding to the thought, but it's a combination maybe. Uh-huh. That's okay, because it's connected stuff. I mean, like the whole thing with the, the, with the controversy and the angels looking on, and she just touches on it here, but in other places she really expounds on it more. Like chapter 29 from The Great Controversy. Uh-huh. That whole chapter is about Lucifer's fall and you know how the, this planet is the... The, what's that word again? It's the... <clears throat> there's a word I'm looking for, but I can't find it. It's the center point of focus. Well, okay. The focal point of the controversy. It's mm. the spectacle of the, for the universe. <laughs> but yeah, the, the things we're talking about, in other places she brings it out more fully. Huh. But, yeah. Very good. Uh, so you want to pick us up there? Where do we? Oh, in the beginning? Yeah, in the beginning. And you know what? Of course you know that. If you have a thought that comes to your mind as we're... Absolutely. All in, right, go ahead. In the beginning, God was revealed in all the works of creation. It was Christ that spread the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. It was His hand that hung the worlds in space and fashioned the flowers of the field. His strength setteth fast the mountains. The sea is His and he made it. It was he that filled the earth with beauty and the air with song. And upon all things in earth and air and sky, he wrote the message of the Father's love. So Christ is the creator. That's right, that's right. Very good. Is it first, is it John? The Gospel of John says, in the beginning was the word and the Right. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yeah. It, it also mentions that everything that was made was made by Him. That's something right. like that. Mm-hmm. I think it's no coincidence that Christ is the one in the Godhead that is associated with the creation. I mean, all, all of the Godhead were involved, I think, but especially Christ is highlighted as the Creator. Hmm. He's, al- he's also highlighted as the Redeemer. And I've been reading a book by A.T. Jones recently, and it talks about that redemption is no less a work of creation than the creation was. Hmm. Like, for example, the Sabbath is connected here. There's two reasons given for the Sabbath. You've probably heard this concept repeated. Creation and redemption. Creation and redemption. So in Exodus 20, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy for... In six days, God created and rested the seventh day. Yeah. That's the reason given. The reason for keeping the Sabbath in Exodus 20 is because remembering the creation. Well, the reason given for the Sabbath in Deuteronomy chapter 5 is you were slaves in Egypt and you've been redeemed from your slavery. Hmm. So, really, so is creation and redemption, like you said. Now, we weren't slaves in Egypt, but Egypt is a symbol of the world. It's a symbol of calling God's people out, right? And so in a very real sense, creation and redemption are, are one and the same. So when we keep the Sabbath, we're acknowledging Christ as our creator and we're acknowledging him as our redeemer hmm. because redemption is a work of creation. That's right, recreation. It's recreation. That's right, he recreates us, recreates our hearts, our minds and the way we think. And we cooperate with him in this. In the, we weren't there to see creation. We take it by. It's an interesting thought. 
when we keep the Sabbath, we are acknowledging that God is our creator, even though we didn't see it happen. Hmm. Man wasn't created until the sixth day. But he'd already created the heavens and the earth and everything in it. By the time we were made on the, on the last day, on the sixth day, the seventh day, he rested. And then he asks us to keep that day. As a, It's like keeping the fourth commandment is like, it's like an, an exercise of faith that mm. God is our creator. Because That's right. when you can't see something, you have to have faith to, to believe it. That's right. And we demonstrate that faith by obeying so I got, I don't know, I got sidetracked there, but all this is connected with Christ as the creator Amen. and Amen. the redeemer, the Sabbath. I think that's why the Sabbath is such a key issue at the end. And it also, uh, we got to have faith that he's our redeemer too. Exactly. When you take the Sabbath away, which is what the man of sin, Antichrist does, when you take the fourth commandment away and put something else in its place, it's just like saying... Christ is not my creator. Mm. Mm. Therefore, Christ is not my redeemer. But they don't overtly, explicitly say that. And, but it's really, it's really the effect of it. Yeah. When you take away that commandment that requires you to exercise faith that Christ is your creator and your redeemer and replace it with something else, it's like uh, the biggest insult. Mm all under the guise of Christianity. You're undermining everything that Christianity is all about while professing to be a Christian and putting Sunday in its place. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if does that make sense. No, yeah. It's like <clears throat> Very good. I think you're up there, Captain. <laughs> so. Now what? sin, now sin is marred. God's perfect. Did I finish? Oh, that's a new paragraph, right? Is it your turn? Yeah, uh, your, your turn. Is it my turn? Yeah. Oh, we, we fin I'm you, pretty sure. He wrote the message of it, the Father's love. We already read that. Yeah. Now sin has marred God's perfect work. Yet that handwriting remains. Even now all created things declare the glory of his excellence. There is nothing except or save the selfish heart of man that lives unto itself. No bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves upon the ground, but ministers to some other life. There is no leaf of the forest or lowly blade of grass, but has its ministry. Every tree and herb and leaf pours forth that element of life without which neither man nor animal could live. And man and animal, in turn, minister to the life of tree and shrub and leaf. The flowers breathe fragrance and unfold their beauty in blessing, in blessing to our world. I don't know if they knew back then when she wrote this about carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange. This book was written like 1898, somewhere around there. Huh. But it's interesting that she says... <coughs> Every tree, I don't know, I'd like to find out. This is interesting. She writes, every tree and, and shrub and leaf pours forth that element of life without which neither man nor animal could live. Oxygen. Hmm. The plants give off oxygen. And man and animal in turn minister to the life of tree and shrub and leaf. We exhale carbon dioxide. The leaves, the plants take that in. Hmm. You know that the, car the plants need carbon dioxide to live. Hmm. We need oxygen. We help each other. Wow. There's a ministry going on there. <coughs> I don't know if they knew about I'd like to look that up and find out when they realized the carbon dioxide, oxygen thing. But that's interesting. Oh, yeah, very. Some science in there. So there's science connected with the work of ministry. The sun sheds its light to gladden a thousand worlds. The ocean itself is the source of all our springs and fountains, receives the streams from every land, but takes to give. The mists ascending from its bosom fall in showers. There's that word we had, uh, you guys had such a fun time with in the What's uh, bosom of the great controversy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in the heart. It's like the mists, the mists ascending from its heart or its bosom fall in showers to water the earth, that it may bring forth and bud. Mm -hmm. 
Is that the end of the paragraphs? Yeah. These paragraphs are different in this. They're not indented. Oh, for real? In the book, the, the PDF here, it's just a space. Oh, oh so, right? just I, a, a gap? Yeah. Okay. I, can, I can tell when it ends, though. <clears throat> it's just saying that nature ministers the different animals, plant life, the water supply. Mm. Uh, the, the, balance, the balance of our ecosystem has embedded within it the principle of ministry. Mm. Giving. Right? Giving, taking. Giving, yeah. Wow. But there's, so there's that full circle. It's only man that has broken that cycle mm. of ministry. Wow. And that's why we have a mess, crime and everything that goes along with it. Wow. That's right. Uh, something stuck out. It says, the ocean itself, the source of all our springs and fountains. So the, the ocean is the source of all... Uh, the springs in the, in the world? Uh. Well, think about it, I guess. The, if, all of, if all of the rivers drained into the sea and they weren't fed, everything would run dry on the continents and you'd just have oceans. But if I'm understanding this correctly, water evaporates off the oceans and it's carried over the land and it, mm. and it rains on the mountains and on the plains. And then that water, as it falls, it, goes, it fills up the channels of creeks and rivers and valleys and flows back out to the oceans. Mm. It's a cycle. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Cool deal. Thank you for that. The angels of glory find their joy in giving. Giving love and tireless watch care to souls that are fallen and unholy. So the holy angels... Uh, their their service uh, they they are joyful in their service of giving watching over even the most sinful people people that are far away from Christ as possible their they their greatest joy is in uh, watching over them and trying to reach them hmm. and impressing their mind with truths to try and reach their hearts that's something hmm. wow Heavenly beings woo the hearts of men. They bring to this dark world light from the courts above. By gentle and patient ministry, they move upon the human spirit to bring the lost into fellowship with Christ, which is even closer than they themselves can know. Wow. So God is working through holy angels to uh, try and draw us to himself. And here we go. We see that uh, selfless service once again. And uh, that's how God operates and even his holy angels. Hmm. Uh, that selfless service. And so there's a lesson for us. We should follow that example and be more concerned about the loss and the erring and how we can reach them mm -hmm. and win them to the fold like the, like the angels are trying to. Like mm -hmm. God is working through the angels trying to do for us, or for, for the fallen sinful world. Amen. It says the angels work to bring the lost into fellowship with Christ, which is even closer than they themselves can know. So he, redeemed human beings will have a closer connection with Christ than even unfallen angels. You ever think about that? Hmm. There's a song that they sing, the holy, holy, holy is what the angels sing. But angels never uh, felt, felt the, the joy, joy that, that our, our salvation brings. You know the song. I love that song. So, yeah, human beings have a more intimate connection with Christ in the redemption process. Mm. He became one of us, right? And we were like the, the, the vine and the branches. And there's that, that redeeming and saving from sin. There's a more intimacy there than unfallen beings can never understand. Mm. They can't sympathize with sin. They haven't participated in it. They don't know what it means to be saved from it. They know enough to help us, you know, what they can, what God, when he sends them on their errands. But Christ can identify with us and we with him more. Mm. So there's a closer connection. Be wow. Because of the incarnation and the redemption process, 
remember the book of Hebrews says, it behooved him to be made in all things like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. How does that verse go? Yeah, something like that. For angels, ah, what is this? He took not on him the nature of angels. Remember that verse? Yeah. But on of man, how does it, uh, how does that go? You want to look that verse up? Yeah, it's very good. Yeah, it says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. And if you ever looked at the seed of Abraham, they had some pretty raunchy characters in there. Uh -huh. In other words, he... This is a controversial point, but this is one of the controversial... This is the stuff I like to talk about. Okay. Christ care. took our nature, our fallen... The nature of Abraham's descendants. Uh -huh. And there were some, was it Judah and some of those guys did some pretty bad stuff. Christ came from their lineage. So mm -hmm. the, the point isn't that Christ sinned. The point is he took a sinful nature. There's a difference between, I guess I can find a way to work in some of these concepts with. Come really? on, come on. <laughs> so there's a difference between a fallen nature, a sinful nature and sinning, right? A sinful nature is the, the liabilities, the the tendency that we inherit. I think this would be good. Go ahead and touch on it. But, the, but, the, but sin itself is an act of the will. It's a choice, right? It's that thing for which we stand condemned and guilty before God. It, is, it involves choice. So Christ was able to take upon him the fallen condition of fallen human beings with a sinful nature, but he never took sin upon himself. He never took, he never participated in the sin. I, I, I gotta right. get that, I, I misspoke. He never participated in the sin. His will never, never yielded to committing sin. He took our sins upon him on the cross and bore them on the cross. So it's important to make that distinction between the sinful nature and the sin for which we are guilty before God. Uh -huh. Some Christians, most Christians don't make that distinction. To most Christians, just having a sinful nature makes you Guilt. guilty. And if that's true, and this is, this is how theology builds upon itself. Well, if Jesus is, if having a sinful nature makes you guilty, then Jesus couldn't have a nature like mine. Therefore, Jesus had to have a nature like Adam's before Adam fell. And what does that do? It separates us from the Savior. It makes Him different from us in the very place where I need help. Uh -huh. So that's why like, the Catholic Church teaches what they call the, the uh, Immaculate Conception. Uh -huh. It basically boils down to their, they believe that Jesus was different from us. He didn't have our nature. Uh -huh. yeah. Ma Mary was conceived immaculately. They... Co they, they they claim. And so Jesus came from her, and, and then he was separated from us, our fallen nature. But that, that's not biblical. This, this, that's right. The statement that we just read, that Christ is even in closer fellowship with us than he is with the angels. Mm. The, a major reason for that is the nature he took. That's right. He can, just like it says in the book of Hebrews, he can identify with us. He, what, he didn't take on him the nature of angels. Mm. He took on him the seed of Abraham. He was made in all points, like, how does that verse go? Like unto his brethren. That he might be a merciful, yeah, high priest. Yeah. So, yeah, that, it's all, it's very practical stuff. It's, yeah, it's something that people argue about, especially in our church. The nature of Christ is a, one of the biggest, there's a big uh, rift, a uh, discord uh -huh. on what that means. But it's very important because if you get if you get that wrong, everything else is affected. That's right. Theological systems are like dominoes. If you if you get put one, put them in the wrong place, they all fall down. Or, hmm. is, that, is that a good analogy? Analogy. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, it's kind of like state of the dead, second coming, the resurrection. All of those are connected, and if yeah. you, if you mess up on one of them. The others don't make sense. Mm -hmm. Well, if the dead are in heaven right now, why do they need to be resurrected at the second coming? Yeah. You know, it just falls apart. Yeah. Same thing with the nature of Christ. If we get that wrong, mm -hmm. the whole system crumbles. Yeah. Well, if I'm guilty because I have a fallen nature, then I'm going to be sinning until Jesus comes and 
there can be no close of probation and you know what I mean? It just it just builds and pretty soon the whole system of truth just collapses. Hmm. That's right. Hmm. We see that. Um, and so by this teaching that that Christ uh, he was given the nature of Adam before he sinned. And that that sets you up to be um, oh well he was God. And he, uh... Exactly. Jesus overcame sin because he was God. I'm not God. Right. He died for me to forgive my sins. And that's enough for me to be saved. What does that do to the gospel? But that's the common Christian belief today. Yeah, they... What does that do? That's why, incidentally, that train of thought is why Seventh-day Adventists are considered legalistic. Hmm. Because to the evangelical mind... What, what I just summed up, what you just brought up, he was God. That's why he overcame. We're not God. He died for us because we're sinners. Da, da, da. That's, that that's encapsulates the evangelical gospel. Yeah, so basically we don't have sin to overcome. We can't because we're sinners by nature. So we're going to sin. Yeah. That's, that's what they would teach. But that's actually not biblical. It's not biblical at no. all. Uh, he had a nature like ours so he could... And he took our sins and bore them on the cross so he could forgive us and empower us, transform us. That's right. That's what the sanctuary is all about. That's right. No, you're right. Jesus overcame sin his whole life. He never sinned. He, by staying connected to the Father, he was able to, he did it in uh, human, uh, uh, divine aid combined with human effort. That's true. And he overcame sin his whole life. And he set an example for us to do. Hey, if he can do it, we can do it. Uh, the one difference with Christ, he, was bo- he didn't need to be converted. He was born of the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, that combination, Mary, he came from Mary and the Holy Spirit. So he is, so we're not born converted, but we can have that new birth experience, Right. But yeah, this, this discussion goes deep. I mean, we could go. I, I had a discussion with a gentleman on Facebook over the summer, one of our young pastors, and we went on for a month, I don't know, for a long time, back and forth. And we're on different sides of the issue. Really nice guy, but it's a big controversy in, the, in our church. Huh. Not just it's not just between evangelicals and Adventists. It's within our church. Yeah, there's not a consensus, huh. wow. and it affects it affects so many things. And that's know. that brings out the idea that we're going to just keep on sinning until Jesus comes. Exactly. And then when Jesus comes, then He'll give us new, new natures. natures. But the problem with that is, well, why even have a sanctuary? And how can you close a sanctuary if people are going to be sinning till Jesus comes? How can Jesus ever stop being our high priest? There can be no close of probation. There can be no time of trouble. There can be no 144,000 going through the time of trouble without a, a mediator to forgive sin. None of that can happen. The whole prophetic system collapses based upon a false view of the, na- the human nature and sin and Christ's, the nature that Christ took. It's so integral, in, integral, no, integral. Integral. In, integral. Integrated. It's, yeah, it's connected with that. I can't say the word, but it's so... Integral. It's so uh, critical to... Okay. It's a critical component to the system, you know what I mean? Some people say, why do you argue about that human nature of Christ thing? Well, it's a pretty important component of the system, you know. That's right. It's like saying, why do you make a big deal about having all the lug nuts on, the, on, your, on your wheel? Just drive. It's just, uh, a, it's just a tiny part. Yeah. It may seem like a tiny part, but it makes all the difference between wrecking your car and getting safely to your destination. That's right. That's good. That's good. Very good. Yeah, that's right. We're called... To- to overcome sin. The Bible says, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you false for the presence of his glory. So <clears throat> Jesus can keep us from sinning if we surrender to him and allow him to work in our life. Mm-hmm. So the idea is we're supposed to be overcoming sin until the day we die, until the mm-hmm. day we see Jesus. Amen. Yeah, amen. All right, so 
I think but, it's your turn. Is it but turning? Yeah. Are you sure? Is it my turn? Yeah. I, well, I think. Go ahead and read. <laughs> but turning from all lesser representations, we behold God in Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, we see that it is the glory of our God to give. Mm. I do nothing of myself, said Christ. The living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father. I seek not my own glory, but the glory of him that sent me. In these words is set forth the great principle, which is the law of life for the universe. All things Christ received from God, but he took it to give, but he took to give. So in the heavenly courts, in his ministry for all created beings, though the beloved Son, through, through, the, thank you, through the beloved Son, the Father's life flows out to all. Through the Son it returns, in praise and joyous service, a tide of love, to the great source of all. And thus through Christ the circuit of beneficence, beneficence beneficence? Is, benef, beneficence? I can't. Uh, I think it's beneficence. Beneficence. I think you're probably right. The, and thus, through Christ, the circuit of circuit of how do you say it again? I can't say uh, it. What beneficence? Beneficence is complete. <laughs> I need some help <laughs> with my pronunciation. <laughs> Representing the character of the great giver, the law of life. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh... <clears throat> What's being said there, Michael? Beneficent, yeah. Isn't that like love? Beneficence? Uh, Generous or good doing. Okay, generous. Beneficent. It doesn't have a... Generous, doing good deed. Doing good. Okay. (coughs) So... uh, it's just saying that there's a, that same cycle we see in nature is with God mm. in Christ, between the Father and Christ. Christ receives from the Father to give. Mm. And, we, and I guess that's why we should be praising God to re- return that cycle. Mm. Where we worship, we return. It's not that God is, what's the word? Dependent upon us. Not that he wants our worship and he's a... What do you, what's the new favorite thing people talk about? People that are conceited and selfish and self-centered. It's not that God wants our worship so he can puff up his, own, his ego. No, it's a, it's a cycle of... We acknowledge that he gives us all things. Can you hold up that cycle by not acknowledging it? Hmm. Huh. Yeah, he expects us to give the gifts he gives us to bless others and amen, amen. recycle that. That's right. Huh. Uh, he gives us so we can give to others. Right? We take so we can give. Hmm. Uh, That's a hard lesson to learn. I've, I've got some learning to do there. Hmm. It's easy to... In this world, everything is... The way the schools, I don't know, the, the, everything is set up. You're, every man his own. You know, you get what you can get. Survival and of the survival fittest. Survival of the fittest. <laughs> That's the foundation of evolution. It's totally contrary to creation, mm. that cycle. That's right. That's Satan's motto. Uh-huh. Satan's motto. Survival of the fittest. Uh, uh, take what you can get. And God's motto is, hey, Share what you have. At the same time, we should be sharing, but I have some learning curve here because there are people that would take advantage of you. And I've been, I've, I think I've been in, we, in a weak place not knowing where to draw the line between helping and getting taken advantage of. Mm, I see, yeah. And, you know, there are cheats out there. The world's not safe. And somebody who has conscientious scruples or con- has a conscientiousness that wants to do right can be easily taken advantage of. And uh, we have to be careful not to enable a wicked person to take advantage of us in a way that doesn't benefit them. Right. But only, you know what I mean? It hurts them more. Hurts them more. So it's, but there is a worthy poor, there's a worthy needy. I think at that point we need to 
be praying and yeah. asking for guidance and wisdom on how to go about certain situations. And maybe the Lord will convict you, you know. We can help people, but at the same time, to the guy floating a sign down in the ghetto, you're going to empty your bank account? Because you want to help them? I mean, you know what I mean? Those are, those are things that I've struggled with. Hmm. How do you know how much to help and what conditions? I've, I've, in the past, I've like, if I, I usually have food or something in the car. I've offered food. Yeah. Sometimes I take it. One guy cursed me down in Florida. He cursed you for when you tried to give him food? For offering him bread. He wanted candy or something. I thought about it though. He might have had a like a diabetic situation. I don't know, but he wanted chocolate. I don't know what, it, what he was. <laughs> and he cursed you. <laughs> it was it was not a pretty sight. Wait a minute. Remember that one time you were telling me <laughs> you went to this homeless guy. You went to buy him food like at Taco Bell or something, and you were getting him a burrito, and he's hot. <laughs> no, I want this. You know. No, at Subway. <laughs> or Subway. The sandwich. <laughs> you were trying to bless him. Was was the food, and he was all being picky, like, no, I don't want this. <laughs> yeah, I kind of think, man, if I was hungry, eat I, whatever you can get. <laughs> no doubt. I don't think you're in a position to be. <laughs> I know. Beggars can't be choosers. Remember I, that saying? I think maybe some of, not all, but some of the poor in this country might be like wealthy compared to some of the poor in other countries. Hmm. You know, when you're when you're malnourished and your stomach's bloated out, uh. some of our some of our poor people here are just fat. But in other countries, <laughs> have you ever seen malnourished people? They're, they they have, turn to skin and bones, and the stomach it gets inflated. Not because they're fat. Up. It's something with the digestive system. I'm not sure the they're not getting enough food. Yeah, there's, but there's something with the, a medical condition that causes their stomachs. Mm, okay, malnourishment. To, yeah, to just bloat out, and they're just skin and bones. Wow. But there are worthy poor in this country, don't get me wrong. And in fact, just being, just wanting to take advantage of people is a type of illness, you know? Oh, wanting to take advantage of people? Like some poor people out there, or some people that are just scammers, and, you know what I mean? Oh, let, uh, Scheming and scamming. <clears throat> well, let me tell you, <laughs> I, <laughs> I was there. I was the worst. I'd be standing in front of the store. People that would come out of the store, I'd say, hey, can you spare change? I'm trying to get a beer. And they go, oh, since you're honest, here you go. And they'd hook me up. So only part of that was true. Uh, mainly, I wanted to get a bag of dope. And so I would take that money and get a bag of dope. And then whatever was left over, I'd get beer. But mm. see how I was mm. trying to come up trying to gain and uh, that self-service, hmm. selfishness, wanted what I can get, didn't want, you know, didn't want to work hard for, get my own hard-earned money, hmm. but wanted to come up off everybody else. And so, <laughs> it's something else. But thank God I don't live that way anymore, and oh. he changed my heart. <laughs> Amen, about time you, hey, can you see that? How much 422. About 10 it was minutes. 35. 35. Right, about 10 minutes. Cool, man. Uh, I'll continue this on unless you had another oh, comment. That's good. All right. But turning from all lesser representations, we behold God in Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, we see that it is the glory of our God to give. I do nothing of myself, said Christ. The living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father. I seek not my own glory, but the glory of him that sent me. In these words is set forth the great principle, which is the law of life for the universe. All things Christ received from God, excuse me, all things Christ received from God, but he took to give. So in the heavenly courts, in his ministry for all created beings, through the beloved Son, the Father's life flows out to all. Through the Son, it returns in praise and joyous service, a tide of love too great to the, to the great source of all. And thus, through Christ, the circuit of beneficence is complete, representing the character 
of the great. Oh, I think we already read this. I think we did. I'm just realizing it. Oh, man. Oh, well, well. <laughs> and so we read that and we touched on it. Sorry about that. We got it. We got it drilled in good now. Yeah. <clears throat> Paint a good picture for us. Uh, let's continue on here. In heaven itself, the law was broken. This law, yeah. Oh, thank you. Of the law of the law of life, which yeah, is this circle circuit of beneficent beneficence. Is that how I say? It? Yeah, beneficence. Beneficence. <laughs> Teaching me a new word. Yeah. So the law of receiving to give, you know, giving, and then uh, that's the law of life. That's how it operates in heaven. God gives, and then uh, we take what He gives us, and and uh, we give to others. But we also return back to Him our praise and thanksgiving. Hmm. That kind of keeps this cycle of uh, selfless service going. It's the law of life. Hmm. Um, okay, in heaven itself, this law was broken. Sin originated in self-seeking. So the opposite of self-sacrificing love, a love that gives, is uh, uh, self-seeking. This is, give me, give me, give me. Take, mm -hmm. I want this, I want that. Take for myself. Mm -hmm. So you see the, the opposites there. Mm -hmm. Lucifer, the covering cherub, desired to be first in heaven. <clears throat> like you were mentioning earlier, he wanted... Uh, he was not satisfied with his position. Mm -hmm. He was the, the one underneath Christ. And uh, no, he wanted the position of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so that that's what led to his rebellion and sin. Mm -hmm. He was seeking, seeking a higher position, self-seeking. Uh, he sought to gain control of heavenly beings, to draw them away from their creator and to win their homage to himself. Therefore he, min he, therefore, he misrepresented God, attributing to him the desire for self-exaltation. Hmm. <clears throat> so he, Saint uh, Lucifer at the time, he painted God with the attributes of himself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, oh, he, he wants all this... Uh, he just wants to exalt himself, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But and that was him. That's what Satan wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Wow. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. That's how he deceived the, uh, the angels with these, with these kind of mm -hmm. uh, ideas. With his own evil characteristics, he sought mm -hmm. to invest the loving creator. So his own sinful characteristics... He tried to put on God. Mm -hmm. Wow, isn't that something? Thus he deceived the angels. And, and, and thus he deceived men. He led them to doubt the word of God and to distrust his goodness. Because God is a God of justice and terrible majesty, Satan caused them to look upon him as severe and unforgiving. Thus he drew men to join him in rebellion against God. And the night of woe settled down upon the world. So the same way Satan deceived the angels, he, he put thoughts of doubt and distrust about God. You know, God is he's he's unfair, he's not he's not just, he's a an exacting taskmaster. And uh <clears throat> he he turned the people, the angels' hearts against uh, away from God. Mm -hmm. And the same way he, he came down. Uh, and he deceived man. He deceived Adam and Eve in the garden it's with true. the same idea. You know, Paul, oh, don't worry about. Uh, yeah, yeah, God just—he doesn't mean what he said mm -hmm. about you shall surely die. Or, He's withholding something. He's, that's what he said to Eve. Essentially, he knows that your eyes will be opened mm. and you'll be like him. You'll be like God. Isn't that what it says? Yeah, he knows that in the day you do it. You will be like God. Mm -hmm. You'll be like Him, knowing good and evil. In other words, He doesn't want God doesn't want you to eat that because if you eat it, you're going to be like Him. 
Mm-hmm. You can see the very same yeah. thing. That's what Satan wanted to be like, to yeah. take God's position. God doesn't want you to be like him. He That's was, why he said, don't eat it. He was imbuing Eve with his, his, with his temptation, the very thing he wanted. Mm. He was leading her on to desire the same thing. Wow. To, to, to be like God. Wow. Not like God in character. They didn't want to, uh, Satan didn't want to be like God in character. He right. wanted to be like God in position and authority. Mm. He wanted the prestige and the, the position of what it meant to be God. That's right. <laughs> and for those that say that the law of God was not in effect until Mount Sinai, here we have, uh, they're breaking the commandment to have mm. no other gods before you because they, That's true. Uh, Eve wanted to be like God. She wanted to be God. Mm-hmm. That's true. <laughs> Isn't that something? That's true. Uh, well, we should. You got five minutes. Five minutes. Let's roll. My turn. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, you read "Woe settled down upon the world." Yeah, you'll start at the earth yeah. was dark. The earth was darkened through misapprehension of God, that the gloomy shadows might be lightened. That the world might be brought back to God, Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. Now, real quick, what does it mean the earth was darkened through misapprehension of God? Is that like a misunderstanding of I God? Think so. I believe so. Okay. A mistaken belief. Huh? A mis- mistaken belief. Okay. okay. Mis- oh, yeah, misinterpreted. Misunderstanding should be all the same. So the earth was darkened through misunderstanding of God. Talking about uh, when sin entered... Uh, the world mm-hmm. through uh, when Eve was. It still Eve. is. The earth is still darkened through a misunderstanding the true character mm. of God, wow. who God really is. That's right. That the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God. Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love. And love cannot be commanded. Hmm. You can't tell your wife, you better love me. Love me now. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Right. <laughs> you, can't, you can't demand someone's respect. You have to... It has to be revealed that you're worthy of that respect and that love. And God has, God has more than revealed that hmm. through Christ. That's right. Uh, where are we? It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. Oh. So that's, how, that's, why we've been, that's why God has taken 6,000 years in the great controversy to bring this thing to a resolution. He needed all this time to appeal to the... the the reasoning powers of mankind to demonstrate his character through Christ to the world mm. and through his people. That's right. And to unfallen he, worlds and, yeah. and to holy angels. It's only false, a, a hallmark of a false religion or a key element, characteristic of a false religion and includes force. Mm. Right. That's why church and state uniting is a bad idea. Mm-hmm. Because, the, because when you have that scenario, the state is going to enforce a religious duty upon the people. That's, a, that's, that's totally contrary to how God operates. That's why the counterfeit church, the Antichrist, has used force in the past. Because it has adopted satanic principles. Mm. That's why it's a representative of Satan. That the church... The Antichrist Church is a representative of Satan because it operates under the principles of Satan. Mm. Right? It uses force, coercion, mm. but God only appeals through love, through love. awakening mm. love by demonstrating love mm-hmm. and appealing to our intellect, right? Wow. Our reasoning powers. That's right. Uh, his his character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. I already read that in there. This this work this work only one only one being in the universe. Let me read that over. This work only one being in all the universe could do. A being is capitalized. That's Christ. Mm. Only he who knew the height and depth of the love of God could make it known. 
Upon the world's dark night, the Son of Righteousness must rise with healing in his wings. Speaking of Christ. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, we're just getting started on this amazing book. Uh, we should wrap it up, though. Yep. Uh, any final thoughts, comments on that? Last little bit we just read. I don't know. you have anything? Uh, only Jesus, who has experienced that love, can come and make that same love known to the world. Mm -hmm. That's what I got out of mm -hmm. uh, that reading. And so. <clears throat> and part of that involved humbling himself and taking a life form that was apparently so degrading to an eternal God. It's a, so the Creator became one of His own creation. Wow. It's like if you're a carpenter and you build tables for a living, you decide to become a table. <laughs> it's, not an exact, it's not a perfect analogy, but it brings across the point. He made us, and He became the thing that He made. Hmm, wow. In order to save us. I mean, you can't save a table because a table doesn't have reasoning powers or a conscience or, you know, a life. But we don't have the ability to create something that has life the way God can. But it kind of brings across the point, would you, be, would you, would you become an ant to redeem the ants? Mm. Or would you become a lower life form for their for the for their own good? Wow! But but Christ, the Creator, the Eternal God, became a a human being, not only a human being, but a human being in a fallen condition, mm. with a fallen nature, in order to redeem them. Wow! He had to stoop to the very lowest in order to pull us up wow. and recreate us in His image. What an amazing love! You can see again there. You can see the importance of the, the nature of Christ in all of that mm. we were talking about earlier. If you mess that up, you mess up the whole plan of redemption. Christ had to meet us where we need help. Mm. And frankly, Adam in an unfallen condition cannot sympathize with me and my struggles. So if Christ took that position, it can't touch me, it can't reach me, it can't yeah. transform me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we can't relate. But Christ can relate. Yeah, Christ can relate to us because He's been in and, this condition. In our shoes. He's been in our shoes. He's been in our DNA. Mm. Wow. A fallen DNA. But He never partook of the guilt. He took our guilt upon Him, but He never generated any guilt. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. Thank God. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, folks, we're going to wrap it up. Hope you were blessed. And... Join us next time as we study this wonderful book about Jesus. And with that said, Michael, you want to close us out? Sure. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for, uh, for Christ, the gift you've given to us in Jesus. Amen. We pray that you will help us to be more like him. Help us to have courage for the days ahead that we can face not only the trouble in the world, but also the trouble within, the things that you're trying to restore and resolve in our lives. Help us to have courage to face it and uh, confidence that through Christ all things are possible. Amen. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. All right.